The battle in Sudan rages on. Mediation efforts and ceasefires have so far failed. Can regional powers that back the rival sides bring enough pressure to stop the fighting? Or is their involvement only complicating peace efforts? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fuli Batibo. Fighting in Sudan between forces loyal to two generals is threatening to turn into a prolonged conflict. Violence erupted in Khartoum a week ago. That followed weeks of power struggles between Army Chief Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and his deputy Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, known as Hemeti, the commander of the Rapid Support Forces, or RSF. So far, hundreds of people have been killed and thousands injured. It's led to thousands more fleeing the capital Khartoum for neighboring Chad. Many of them fear this may be the beginning of a much wider conflict. Now, outside forces are complicating the situation with both sides receiving support from regional and global powers. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, this report. From chaos to calm, intense street battles have thrown Sudan's capital into turmoil in the past few days. Its streets are emptying as thousands of people flee Khartoum. The conflict is driven by a power struggle between Sudan's army, led by Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and the Rapid Support Forces, a paramilitary group, under Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hemeti. The two generals have been jostling for control of the country's economy and its military. That has torn up plans for return to civilian rule. This destruction and sound of gunfire did not leave room for happiness that our beloved people deserve. We are very sad for this pain, but there's still hope that together we'll pass this crisis and come out of it more united and strong. One army, one nation. Sudan's strategic location on the Red Sea and its access to the Nile River and vast gold reserves have long been coveted by other powers, leading to both sides being backed by outside forces. Hemeti accuses Egypt of colluding with Burhan and sending fighter jets and soldiers to help the Sudanese military. Egypt has denied the allegations and said its forces were in Sudan for a joint military exercise. Hemeti has close ties with Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Libya. And Libyan warlord Khalifa Haftar has reportedly sent military supplies to the Rapid Support Forces, which he denies. The Russian mercenary organization Wagner Group has also been accused of plundering Sudan's gold resources to bankroll its operations in Ukraine. We don't have yet uh, information that it has been actively engaged in conflict, but it is, of course, in, in no way it can be denied that it has been somehow behind the Hemetis organization and trying to protect that RSF's dominations in Sudan's politics. Israel is involved too. Its foreign minister, Eli Cohen, has been engaging with Burhan on normalizing ties between the two countries in recent years. A prolonged conflict would also disrupt plans by UAE companies to build ports, as well as China's investments in Sudan. Any escalation would have regional implications, threatening nearby states like South Sudan that export oil through its northern neighbor. There would also be a risk of rising numbers of refugees fleeing across borders, causing more instability. And for Sudan itself, the longer the conflict goes on, the bigger the risk of it widening and the greater the suffering of its people. Felix Nyawara for Inside Story. Well, let's now bring in our guests for today's Inside Story. Joining us from Cairo is Matt Nashed, who's a journalist and analyst covering the Middle East and North Africa region. 
In Khartoum, Sudan, Kholoud Khair, founding director at Confluence Advisory, a Sudan-based think tank. She's also host of Spotlight 249 on Capital FM Sudan. And in Montreal, Canada, is Khalid Midani, associate professor and chair of the African Studies program at McGill University. Khalid is also author of many political and economic publications on Sudan. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. Kholoud in Khartoum, let me start with you if I can. Uh, I understand that you've been coordinating safe passage for people to leave Khartoum. Can you tell us first about the current situation on the ground? Are people able to leave? And if they are, where are they heading to? Well, it's, it's quite a difficult, gut-wrenching decision to make whether to stay or to go. There are risks, considerable risks to both. Some people have made the uh, calculation that it's, it's better to stay um, and wait to, for a better sort of, you know, exit, a more secure exit. And others have decided that it's too dangerous for them to stay. And so many are heading southwards towards Jazeera Strait, uh, State on Medani Street. But what we've just heard in the past few hours is that Medani Street has seen some clashes between the paramilitary RSF and the Sudan Armed Forces and has been um, taken over by the paramilitary forces, which makes it difficult um, for people to traverse mostly because experiences of others uh, of passing checkpoints by the paramilitary forces um, say that people have experienced looting and people have experienced, um, you know, being shot at and being sent back. So mm -hmm. that is no longer as much of a viable option. Have people been able to leave the country and, and head to Chad or other uh, neighboring countries? Well, Khartoum is bang smack in the middle of Sudan, and so mm. it's very difficult to get to any of Sudan's borders. Um, of course, Sudan borders many countries, and um, you said earlier that I was, you know, helping people to find safe passage. Um, everyone is doing that. Uh, mm. There are WhatsApp groups that have been set up, uh, sort of Twitter sites, um, spaces that have been set up. Um, people are calling each other using, most importantly, local resistance committees um, who know the, the streets really well. Um, and it's just a case of, you know, at this point, almost Russian roulette, whether you right. make it through or not. Khulud, we are discussing today on Inside Story the foreign component to the confrontation. Are you aware on the ground in Sudan of any direct or indirect involvement by regional countries in the current fighting? We've heard reports of Libyan warlord Khalifa Haftar perhaps sending military support to uh, the paramilitary RSF, reports of Egypt sending support to, to the army. What is the extent of outside involvement in the current fighting? Well, those of us who have access to the internet, who still have access to the internet, have been keeping up uh, with the reporting on what's going on in Sudan. And increasingly, uh, people are, you know, unsurprised by the fact that Sudan's neighbors would get involved for several reasons. Uh, one, there been, there's a history of some of these actors, particularly Egypt, favoring SAF, um, the United Emirates, sort of having working relationships with both the armed forces and the paramilitary forces, but favoring the paramilitary forces. Um, so, you know, there is an awareness that this is happening. Happening. By now, one would have expected that supplies, particularly for the paramilitary force, would be dwindling, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So it mm. does track with reporting that there is external engagement. All right. Matt Nashed in Cairo, let me come to you. Tell us more about uh, the foreign component to the current fighting. Who supports whom and to what end? What are some of these regional powers wanting to get out of Sudan? Yeah, I think, you know, the fault lines right now look increasingly clear, right? And, and they're not so different, I think, than the fault lines that predated the fighting as well, uh, as, as Khalid alluded to. Um, uh, SAF, you know, Sunnis armed forces have always been favored and, and, and outright supported and then coordinated with by uh, Egypt. And this dates back to a very, very long history, brief, uh, dates back to the current leadership in, in Egypt right now. Um, and, you know, as, as a result of that, um, I think Egypt obviously has a number of strategic interests that um, they feel is quite existential for them. And, and that's on one side that they would like to secure that. I mean, most notably, we have the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and, and obviously, um, you know, Egypt and Sunni's armed forces have coordinated with a number of military drills in order to kind of flex their muscles to Ethiopia in the past. And, uh, and I think there's also the economic side that Egypt has benefited from a number of kind of cheap produce and, and, and trade that, that uh, with both armies controlling uh, significant amounts of their domestic economies, um, that partnership is, has become a lifeline for Egypt as well. 
considering it's very difficult economic situation right now. So that's on that side. Egypt also, of course, has more of a ideological, or I would let's say less of an ideological sense, but maybe just through its, its longstanding partnership, it also just has this view of security in a conventional sense, actually, where it, it views that the guarantors of security have to come through military men and military institutions. On the other side, very quickly, you know, uh, obviously, Hamiti is, is being supported. Um, you know, Predata had a long relationship into this crisis, had a quite a long, extensive relationship with the Emirates as well. Um, not as deep and as long as Egypt, obviously, with, with the staff's military. But still, there was partners in providing gold mines there. There was obviously the, the mercenaries that were sent to Yemen accordingly. And so it's no surprise that, obviously, the Emirates are supporting um, Hamiti in this fight, I think, both diplomatically and then, right. and, you know, reportedly, um, their hands seem to be in the background, you yeah. know, militarily as well, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I think, though, just to conclude very quickly, there's the ideological prism in the way that the Emirates view security, which I think is very different than why, how the Egyptians view security. Uh, most mm -hmm. people understand why the Egyptians are doing this, but for the Emirates, I think there's there's quite a very fundamental fear, I think, for them of, um, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the remnants of, of Bashir's, uh, you know, Islamist loyalists particularly. Um, I think they feel that Burhan is particularly under pressure for them. There was reports that Burhan, um, you know, was under pressure from the Emirates to try to rein that constituency in, but it seems more and more reportedly that he is being pressured from within that. So, okay. I mean, there's that element of it, but common to both of them, I'll stress, is that neither actor, regardless of how they view security interests, for the mm. Emirates obviously doesn't want this ripple effect of political Islam in any way, but neither of them want a civilian democratic movement. Okay. And, and as a result uh, of that, the two groups they backed have We'll resisted. get to that. We'll get to that in a moment, Matt. I just want to bring Khalid into the conversation and ask you, Khalid, about your thoughts about why some of these regional powers are involved in this conflict and, and how you think their involvement, a country like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, or, or the UAE, as Matt mentioned, how does it complicate the conflict? Well, it complicates it greatly, not, in term, not only in terms of finding an eventual settlement, uh, ceasefire and then hopefully to, to return to uh, discussions in terms of overseeing a civilian dem democratic regime. But also, um, these are two uh, generals that really are thriving on the financial uh, support that they're receiving from mm. the UAE on the part of Hemeti and, of course, uh, with respect to, um, to Burhan, the logistical and financial support from Egypt. But I did want to emphasize that overall it complicates it because of where Sudan is geographically. Uh, mm. In addition to the financial patronage, we have uh, the uh, Red Sea area. Um, Sudan is extremely strategically placed. And so if we uh, look at it in a kind of um, a larger way, what we see um, over the last year since the, since the revolution of, of 2019 is a scramble over building a naval base in Port Sudan. And that is something that the UAE uh, cares deeply about. They've already invested $6 billion, uh, I believe, estimated to build a naval uh, base in Port Sudan. We have Russia, of course, interested in it, in it as well. The, U the United States has conducted military exercises with the mm. UAE, Port Sudan. And we also have China that's interested in mm. that region. So that part of the story is crucial because it gives us a long-term understanding of why right. Sudan is so important. In addition to that, it's important to understand that there are extreme financial investments on the part of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, in addition right. to the logistic financial support. A billions yeah. of dollars were land to deal Let with Let me ask you about, about that. The UAE and Saudi Arabia are the financiers of the Sudanese army and the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, who, as Matt said, lent them fighters for the war in Yemen. But now that the war in Yemen is winding down, it seems, do you think these two sides can get the generals to listen? Khalid. I do. I think, yes, I think that's a very important point. I do think that, that, that since uh, Saudi Arabia has sought an exit option in Yemen, um, and that and the UAE obviously, of course, has uh, mired itself in Yemen and that uh, proved unsuccessful. I think that it's um, uh, most people acknowledge that at this point there are changing calculations on the part of the United Arab Emirates. They no longer have that kind of interest. In other words, Hemeti no longer serves the role that he uh, served so well for them. 
uh, in Yemen and also, um, uh, of course, in Libya when they also supported him against uh, alongside um, Haftar in Libya. I think that calculation means that uh, there is a possibility that the UAE would uh, put pressure on Hemeti uh, or rather withdraw uh, any kind of support. Um, I do believe that Hemeti's desperation from his part, there are other calculations from Bhutan, have very much to do uh, with the fact that he has lost the kind of external patronage that he wanted uh, or, or kind of enjoyed in the past, mm. nor has he been able to get the kind of support from Ethiopia that he was right. counting on from Abiy Ahmed. Okay, Khulud, let me uh, come to you on this. Uh, as we've heard from both Matt and uh, Khalid, there are a lot of players, outside forces uh, in this conflict, which means a lot of would-be mediators. Um, you know, from, from uh, Egypt, of course, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, the Russians, even the Chinese to some extent, as you heard. How do you think this complicates uh, the solution to, to, to ending the fighting? And which of these mediators uh, do you think stands a chance at convincing the generals to stop the fighting? Well, it, it complicates it massively. You know, the fact that you have these different actors who have different interests in Sudan, but also in the region. So, for example, um, the reporting that General Haftar in Libya is sending troops to support um, Hemeti and the, the paramilitary forces, whereas um, the Egyptians are sending uh, aerial support and other types of support to the Sudan armed forces on the other side. Whereas in Libya, they're on the same side, Haftar and, and the Egyptians. And so there's a bit of a sort of chaotic scene here and it makes it very unpredictable um, which interests will win out in, in which sort of geography. I think when it comes to mediators, it's not a case of choosing one over the other. But Clearly, who has the most the, the leverage Egyptian... right now? Yeah, so the, the thing is, is that that's exactly the point, that leverage is required. And none, no one, not even those who have leverage, have put leverage on the table, which is why we have had three consecutive failed ceasefires. But the Egyptians have been able to secure enough of the ceasefire to land their plane, pick up their soldiers and leave. Uh, the Emiratis said that they have helped the Egyptians do that and secure those reassurances. So clearly there are avenues for a ceasefire. The issue is that all of these actors need to work together. They need to be in lockstep with each other, including all the P5 in Russia, China and the US and others. And that we haven't seen that happening. We've seen a very fragmented international response. OK. Matt, you mentioned earlier that it is um, not in the interest of the Saudis or the Emiratis to have a civilian-led government uh, in Sudan. Why is that? And does that mean that these two countries cannot mediate in this conflict? Well, let me let me qualify my statement by saying I don't think it's the interest of, of pro-democracy groups, genuine ones in Sudan, to have quote-unquote civilian-led, which I think mm -hmm. is just a euphemism for failed partnerships of military, um, you know, personalities that de facto control the state with civilian faces. So I think we need to use the same terminology that we would use for any Western democracy. It's either a mm -hmm. civilian one or it's a military-controlled one. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I don't think regional players are interested at all uh, in a civilian um, democracy. And that's just not exclusive to Sudan. I don't think that they're interested in civilian rule anywhere throughout the region, because I think any example of that, but particularly one, perhaps in Egypt's case, that's so close to it neighborly, has ripple effects um, that can then, you know, obviously encourage a number of other people to envision a different life for themselves as well. And so, you know, absolutely, I think this is what I mean. I, I, I think from, despite the conventional um, view of security from Egypt and the ideological more view of security from the Emirates, both of them fear a domino effect accordingly that can threaten, you know, their, their interests and the security of their regimes when they see any kind of democratic example um, that, that erupts anywhere. And, and Sudan, in many ways, is actually a democratic example, just maybe not in the sense of the blueprint of the quote-unquote nation-state, but the spirit of democracy is very much thriving there. And, and a lot of the things that Khalud mentioned in terms of how these resistance committees are assisting civilians, you know, that's that's indicative of how that spirit of, of, of democracy and credibility of actors that are rallying for one another um, is still existing, even after the war. All right. Uh, Khalid, your thoughts about this. What are these regional powers, including uh, the Emirates and, and uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt even, uh, what are they more interested in right now? A stable Sudan or progress towards establishing a, a democratic government? 
Well, they're not, uh, without question, I agree with your guest 100 percent. They're interested in a stable uh, Sudan. But the important question or the question that raises itself, as we say, is can there be a stable Sudan with one of these generals taking over? And I think the, the answer is a categorical no. I think what the depth of this crisis, what it has demonstrated, uh, even on the part of um, Egypt, UAE and Saudi Arabia, is that a military government in Sudan is not capable, actually, of delivering stability. And here we turn to the United States, which I think is important, including mm. the Congress that asked for sanctions against these generals. Uh, for the United States, for good or bad, uh, but uh, the, the position is that there is no possibility for stability for Sudan and the region, which is even more important to them, without returning to some form of civilian government. I right. think that that is Do you think really enough clear. international pressure has been applied by the U.S.? Absolutely not. In fact, uh, there are Americans in Congress who are complaining and criti criticizing the Biden administration. However, as the, the, the crisis deepens and, uh, you know, Americans, uh, citizens are not even, you know, uh, taken out of Sudan except staff, I think the criticism in, in Washington is emerging. Uh, that, and uh, unfortunately, the depth of the crisis and it, uh, how it's going to threaten the region is uh, pushing the Biden administration to try to find an option here. Uh, and this has happened in the past. There is al always the possibility the United States can actually put uh, pressure, particularly on Saudi Arabia and UAE, because actually they were part and parcel of helping to oversee the framework agreement that did not go through. That's key. The, the final aspect that I'd like to mention is Egypt. Egypt mm. is absolutely not in in a, a transition to the civilian government. But Egypt is making calculation from my miscalculation from my perspective in the sense that they, they actually are underestimating the influence of the former members of the National Congress Party that are backing Burhan. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel that the Burhan would be on their side. And even though they're, uh, the regime at least is opposed to the Islamists, so to speak, they are underestimating the strength and the role of the remnants, as we call in Sudan, of the National Congress Party. Here again, we want to talk about a final important source of patronage, and that is the vast wealth of the National Congress Party and its members. Much of that wealth actually is in other countries, other bank accounts. This is why discussions of targeted sanctions against these two generals is, I, I believe, is going to be extremely important. It's already on the table in Congress in the United States. Okay, Hulud, your thoughts about this? Uh, Khalid says targeted sanctions against these two generals, and he also said something interesting, that Sudan cannot be led by either of these two generals. If not them, then who or what? I mean, no one here wants either general to rule. That has become, uh, that was always crystal clear in the way that uh, the pro-democracy movement has been pleading with the international community to heed their call for a fully civilian government. When Burhan and Himati inherited the state from uh, Omar al-Bashir and started this, you know, sort of domino effect that has led us to where we are, um, they faced uh, uh, sort of a resistance from uh, pro-democracy groups at every turn. And it was the political uh, process and the political agreement preceding the clashes on Saturday that really tried to um, embed military rule into into a sort of a future political dispensation. That has been outright rejected by many people in this country. There is a sort of idealism, I think, within the international community that perhaps these journals generals could be reformers. Perhaps they could somehow, and against all odds, midwife a civilian democracy in Sudan. Everyone in Sudan already knows that that's not possible. Um, so for me, it's a question of, you know, I think alternatives will emerge. I think we're in this conflict for a while. And, and as this conflict, you know, continues, we will see uh, civilian alternatives emerge. But what is crystal clear right now is that neither one of these generals, even if one of them were to win militarily, will have the legitimacy after this level of conflict in Khartoum to be able to govern. So there's absolutely no stability to be found from either one of them uh, successfully coming out of this. Matt, your thoughts about this. What do you believe is the way out of this current impasse? And, and who do you think, coming back to our initial question, who do you think is best equipped today to mediate a successful resolution to this conflict? Uh, listen, the, the way out to the current situation um, I fear isn't going to be as easy. And this is something that the, the global community, in particular Western countries, have brought about themselves. Uh, I think failing to pay um, sensitive and adequate attention to Sudan and being receptive to the nuances of the country and also the demands of the pro democracy movement, um, they have, in a way, uh, through their miscalculations, 
um, and I think through their own time frames and interests, um, uh, accelerated a confrontation here between two generals. And, and the reality is war is always easier to prevent than to stop. That said, I, I would echo, you know, Khalud's thoughts and recommendations and calls here that it has to be a coordinated effort. And while there might be a Russian hand or, or Chinese interests here or, or the U.S. Or, or whatever it might be, I do think actually that in Sudan, maybe it's the optimism in me that unlike, you know, previous crises or conflicts, you know, that have erupted um, over the last 10 to 12 years, I namely think of, you know, for instance, Syria or, or Ukraine, where the Security Council has been so fundamentally polarized. Um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, there are uh, maybe a shared incentive here to uh, contain the crisis. I think we need to think right now in smaller steps, and, and, and that should be, you know, pressuring to get the immediate ceasefire, opening up humanitarian corridors, and prioritizing pro uh, civilian protection. And, and I do think, you know, obviously, uh, the Security Council will be important because you're going to have larger partners that are larger countries that are tied to also having relations with Egypt and the Emirates as well. While they are U.S. partners, we understand global alliances are getting more blurry by the day. Uh, and, and to have that pressure and just that the cohesive and coordination there, uh, especially with Chinese interests with the Belt and Road, they don't want to see this expand. Um, then I think there, there, there would be a possibility to rein these, these, these countries in. These are the countries that are backing these generals. And, and it's a sad reality that they, they need to be railed in and be cooperative uh, in order to put out the, the fire that they, you know, put gasoline on to begin with. Um, Khalid, so, yeah. yeah. Khalid, I'll give you yeah, the last so. word because we're almost coming to, to the end of our program. Uh, your thoughts about how we end the current impasse and what happens if this conflict doesn't end swiftly? Yes. Um, 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 first of all, I want to echo what my colleagues have, have, have said, particularly with respect to the first step being uh, dealing with the humanitarian crisis. And there is a great deal of experience in terms of uh, pushing towards and continuing to push towards a ceasefire and a humanitarian cor corridor, as our as um, my colleague said, I do think that we have to focus, um, and the, these regional countries, international actors, have to focus not only about in the past what they got out of Sudan, but what what they have to lose. And I'm including even the European Union in terms of the issue of, of immigration uh, from Sudan, let's say, to Europe. Every country, every region that has been involved directly in this conflict has a great deal to lose. I think that a more coherent um, uh, kind of um, um, uh, uh, cooperation among both regional and external actors is, is extremely important. And here I would reference not only the Middle East countries, but actually kind of post-conflict African countries like Sierra Leone and Liberia. Mm. And that is that these conflicts have seen, as you know full well, a transition to civilian democracy. I think that that model is important. And here I mention at the African context, because right. the regional players at the African Union, the African countries who have the most to lose and may not necessarily have the greatest leverage, may must be included as an essential part of the solution because of their experience in the African continent of right. actually transitioning post-conflict societies into a civilian democracy. We cannot so look just regional at African bodies Bodies like EGAD and the African Union must be included. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to leave the conversation there. Thank you to all three of you for such an insightful discussion. Khulut Khair in Khartoum, Matt Neshed in Cairo and Khalid Medani in Montreal. Thank you very much once again. And thank you too for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fuli Batibo, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. Bye for now.